Okay, so with the recording on, uh, I was saying that the, the topic of this week is the integration of JavaScript in the browser and especially mastering the API of the DOM for finding elements and modifying them and so on. And uh, what we are learning in these two labs, uh, so lab for last week, uh, uh, concerning the HTML and CSS, and especially Bootstrap, uh, and tomorrow's lab uh, also about uh, the how to give some dynamic behavior to that uh, to the result of lab number two. Uh, we we'll see that uh, um, the basic concepts uh, are maybe quite easy. There are not so many basic concepts, but uh, uh, getting the results that you want uh, takes a lot of. Uh, work and trial and error and maybe f uh, searching the internet for documentation and so on. So basically, it's not possible uh, unless you are doing that uh, full time for a job uh, to um, master all the nuances of Bootstrap, all the nuances of CSS and uh, all the strange things that happen or the tricks that say they may happen in the, in the DOM in JavaScript. So um, a lot of work is uh, uh, finding the better way of doing something or finding a solution to a problem that it should be easy, but you don't know what, which attribute to touch, uh, which property has to be modified and so on. So that's uh, one of the difficulties. Of course, uh, we are not, uh, um, our goal is not becoming, uh, you know, uh, web designers uh, in the graphical sense of view. So uh, our, uh, our goal would, would be more on programming. Uh, so if you if you don't get the exact result uh, that we that we propose in the in the text of the exercise, uh, it doesn't matter as long as you understand uh, actually what uh, what you are doing, what you are getting, and uh, different designers will come up uh, with different solutions. That's uh, that's normal. Okay. So we are trying in the the labs are sort of a challenge uh, each week. Uh, uh, there is something simple to do, so putting together, for example, the information in last uh, and uh, more or less uh, getting the right layout, uh, and that was easy. And then getting the right details, uh, the location, the size of the different elements uh, and the colors and so on was uh, more of a challenge. And so, if you um, have, if you want to invest more time, of course, uh, you may you may learn more. So this is sort of a uh, we, are, we are trying to exploit the labs also to help you uh, learning uh, more and especially learning to find information that you need. If we, can, if we um, may support you with this process, uh, uh, you are welcome to ask uh, at any time also during the week. Okay, uh, As you know that probably the one hour of lab uh, was not, uh, is not really enough to finish the exercise. Maybe it's the time for, for completing that if you already know everything. Okay, but uh, if, since the process to learn, uh, do the lab hours will be to, to help you get started, and then you can finish it. Uh, we are not, uh, you are not going to have to submit it and so on. So uh, take your time and try to learn. Okay, if there are any any, any suggestions, uh, we are very welcome to to um, consider the, those. Um, a second uh, uh, introductory note they want to uh, to say is about um, the calendar. Uh, I wrote yesterday a message on Slack just for reminding everybody that uh, there will be the, uh, the Easter vacation in, in next week. So next week uh, will be a, a very quiet week. We won't have the, the labs, we won't have the video chat. Uh, maybe we have time to publish a couple of more videos about more, maybe exercises or something like that. And then the, the, the new topics, the new... Uh, um, the continuation of the, of, the, of, the, of the course will come the week after Easter, and, uh, and we will start uh, also thinking about the server side, not just the client side. So we have a week to try to, um, to have all, all these new concepts about uh, the browser and the DOM and the, and the CSS. Uh, we have one more week uh, to, to settle them so that we can be more proficient later on. Okay, that's for my introduction. So I uh, already took five minutes, it's mm, too much, more than I expected. And, and so I'm, I'm open for your questions now. Okay, there is this question. By, sorry, 
could I just mute for a second? Okay, the usual stupid marketing call. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Roberto uh, uh, is asking um, if we have uh, an element of class A and uh, an element of class B, uh, is there any way to create a class C that declares uh, to have the properties of A and B? Um, yes and no. I mean, uh, let me share the screen. It's something that we'll study in detail when we study classes and prototypes, okay? So I will give you only a, a quick answer now, and then it's one of the next topics in the pipeline in one of the next lectures is about classes and prototypes, which is a share screen. Screen, this one. Uh, yes, I hope it's the right one. Okay, uh, so the idea is that if you have an object, uh, you say um, let A is an object with a property. Uh, I didn't know name X and age 18. And it's, it's not exactly your question, so I, I come into that, okay? Let B uh, is an object uh, with the other two attributes that may be the, I don't know, the size, uh, 33, whatever, uh, and that's it, okay? So you have these two objects. Uh, you want to create a new object, uh, C, uh, that combines uh, the, the properties of A and B. B, let me open the chat so that we can see if you have any. Where did it go? Sorry, I'm looking for the chat window. Okay, let's move it to the other screen. Okay, so how, um, how to combine the properties of uh, object A and object B, it's quite easy because you just have to um, remember the object create, uh, object creation methods where you can actually um, uh, specify uh, a starting object and then add the properties of, of another one. So uh, it will be something like uh, uh, object of create by taking the, the first object A and adding uh, the properties B. Mm -hmm. um, this was uh, uh, mentioned in the slides. But uh, um, okay, okay, so the in HTML. Okay, so let, let, let me finish just this uh, because it's a uh, it's another topic which will be interesting. So what we what we are doing here is combining the properties of objects. Okay, um, in JavaScript you know there are no real classes, and so uh, it's not uh, possible to create a, a new class that inherits for two other different classes. We'll see a mechanism for doing that using classes and prototypes. Because right now we are creating a single object. If you want to create a family of objects that always inherits the same attributes of the families of objects from A and the families from B, uh, that would be, uh, you would have to do that for each and every instance. So, so it's not what you want. Um, when uh, one of the next classes lectures will be about classes and prototypes, so we'll touch this point. But your question, I understand it was different. So um, you say you have, a, you have an element with a class, so we have an element, uh, for example, division, a div, class A, uh, that does something. And somewhere else, you have another element, you say uh, div class equal to B. Okay, and then you want later on to tag another element with a class, uh, let's call it AB. Mm, AB. And you want 
the same element of class A and B. So you want this to behave in the same way. So another class C, that you want it to behave like it was A and B, like this. Is this the question? So if you want an element, instead of taking that, we do two classes, A and B. You want to define a new class that will combine automatically uh, whatever is in A and whatever is in B. OK. So um, this is a, um, so I, we want to define a new class. So it is not a problem of HTML, of course. It's a problem of CSS. And in CSS, you cannot do that uh, natively. Uh, because the key, CSS can only define, um, define uh, let's say, uh, basic properties. Uh, so at every class, there is only one, uh, one construct. Uh, for example, we have the class A with a given proper set of properties. And then we have class B, the selector, okay, that selects all the elements with class B, another set of properties. So let's set property in one and the set of properties too. Uh, what do we have to do is right now is to define a class C where we list all the properties in one and we list all the properties in two. Uh, there is no way in CSS, in basic CSS, uh, to, um, to do that, uh, say, dynamically by saying, okay, take uh, uh, automatically, uh, 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 everything that comes from A and uh, everything that comes from B. Okay, this is not uh, uh, valid. Uh, the problem is that, uh, you know, the, the grammar of CSS is just uh, one level deep. Selector, properties. And, uh, um, and the declaration that declares properties. Uh, we, we don't have a syntax for creating a new uh, rule by combining existing rules. Okay, uh, not valid in CSS, basic CSS. There are two extensions. There are extensions of or, or extensions to CSS that you can use. That are called, there are two, uh, two very famous one. One is SAS and the other is less. There are uh, languages that are built on top of CSS that let you do this uh, with a, a concept called mixing. Mixing is uh, creating a rule, combining existing rules. Creates a rule, combining existing ones. So this can be done in, in SAS or in less with a slightly different grammar. And, um, and, uh, but these are uh, languages that need to be compiled. So for example, if you have something in SAS, then you need uh, uh, that, that has this kind of construct, it can declare that. Uh, it needs to be compiled down, uh, down to regular CSS, and then it can go to the browser. This compilation uh, usually is done uh, on the server side, so before delivering. So you write your SAS, uh, SAS as mixing, as variables. So for example, a very useful uh, feature if you want to define a color and they reuse it uh, in different places. And so uh, again, right now, if you want to use the same color in different rules, uh, you have to repeat the same number many times. Okay, you cannot refer to a variable. So these are simple, simpler uh, issue here. Just we are just want we just want to remember value. No, no, we don't want to do anything fancy. But uh, uh, again, CSS does not allow that. So this kind of uh, of, um, of parametric rules also. So it's a it's a language, a sort of a macro language, as we you may call that, uh, for defining rules. And you write this SAS code and you compile that to CSS and load the CSS in the browser. This compilation usually may happen in the server side, so before you give the CSS to the browser, or you might uh, move the CSS compiler into the browser. So the browser will load the, C the SAS code, will compile it in the browser, in the JavaScript, and then will give the CSS back to the, the, the page. Of course, it's, in this case, it will be slower. It's easier to do because everything runs in the browser. You don't need any intelligence on the server. Um, but uh, uh, it, it's, um, 
uh, it will slow down uh, the, the page processing, of course, because every time it has to uh, expand uh, a language into uh, basic rules and then interpret these rules. Uh, so these are uh, good questions, but uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, that's the reason why these new languages were invented, uh, because of CSS basically, it's a very low level language, like writing in assembler, you have to write and repeat many times the same information. Uh, instead of uh, having something at a higher level to combine existing rules or define rules just, that are just used for as as fragments to to insert into other rules that will not be applied to anything. So rules with fake selectors and so on. So all of this can be done with these languages, and uh, it's an extension of CSS. So we didn't we did, we didn't feel like putting also these new <laughs> languages right now at the moment. But if you want to explore, this is the, is the direction to go. Um, okay, the um, uh, Pierre Luigi is asking the difference uh, between between uh, image and SVG. Uh, okay, an image basically is used for loading. Uh, an, an external image source equal and uh, image file stored somewhere. Of course, it's uh, it's uh, the uh, URL for an image file. Okay, and uh, um, it downloads the image and inserts them in the page at this point. SVG is actually. Um, the name of, for, for SVG stands for uh, Scalable Vector Graphics. So uh, the, for, the, while the image uh, works for raster images, uh, basically uh, bitmaps uh, such as uh, PNG, uh, GIF, uh, uh, JPEG, and so on. Hmm. So you have just a, a matrix of pixels. Uh, SVG uh, defines a, um, vector, uh, a picture in terms of uh, uh, vector primitives, such as uh, uh, lines, uh, circles, arcs, uh, shapes. Uh, and so on. So you can define maybe a circle that will intercept a triangle, and then you go, uh, only get the intersection. You can reason about the, the the contour, the perimeter, or you can reason about the surface. Uh, so you can do intersection, union, overlapping, and so on, or all these shapes. Uh, it's the difference uh, between using a graphical editor and the uh, and the vector editor, where you actually are putting shapes in there. Um, and so SVG is a language hmm, which is based uh, on vector primitives and, uh, and uh, an, an XML language. So you can language. You can define uh, your picture by uh, using this, uh, uh, this language, basically, and uh, um, and you are describing how to draw the image. The advantage is that is uh, uh, basically infinitely scalable. You can increase uh, or decrease the size, uh, but be, since you are drawing a line every time, so the browser will reconstruct the image at a different size. So it's used, for example, especially in logos, uh, in images that need in a uh, tool tips or something like that, uh, images that should be presented probably at different sizes. So instead of creating an image, or maybe 27 images, one uh, 20 pixel wide, another 30, another 35, another 45, we define that in, in a vector way. In our uh, example, in our, uh, where, is, where was that? Uh, no. Was here, okay. For example, in the solution, we I, I think we used one of them to draw the man that you saw, there's path 
uh, and this, there, is, there is this strange language that described uh, the, the shape of a path. Uh, this can, this uh, is an empty path, so it's a contour. This one is uh, um, a field image and so on. Uh, usually, of course, we don't write uh, uh, these uh, uh, SVG by hand. We use any any vector editor. Uh, so you can use, an, uh, for example, the, um, um, if an open source editor, for example, would be uh, in Inkscape. But there are also other editors, uh, the Illustrator by Adobe and so on, can export, you can draw a picture, you can export the result in, in SVG, and you can insert the SVG on, in line, like we did here. Um, in the example, of course, we didn't put these numbers by hand, okay? We just uh, draw, uh, do the, the, or in this case, we, we just found it online, so we copy it, but in general, we, um, we draw it in a, a picture program, and then you, we insert that. Of course, this is an, an inline SVG image, so it's defined inside the page. We could also load an SVG file externally, so it will have an, a source attribute that will download the SVG file and draw it there. So it's a way of creating vector images in your page. Um, so the next question is from by Rocco, that asking that, uh, uh, Went over all the possible DOM interaction pretty quickly. Can you just go more in front about the get computed styles, how it works, and what's and why? Well, okay. Um, yes, the, the DOM is a very big uh, topic, and we work with the DOM uh, for all the rest of the course. So <laughs> it's not something that we can finish in one uh, in uh, one in one lecture. Um, we we'll stick. We'll keep working on that uh, even when we move to React and so on. It's all all of this uh, is is the manipulation of the DOM. Uh, what we would say is that right now we are at the beginning of the course where we have the knowledge uh, to start doing something. Um, so um, the get computer style is the que your your question. Um, uh, it's a so um, you have an element, okay, uh, to which uh, you may apply a cascade of styles. So you have the default browser styles on which you can apply the different style sheets on which you can apply inline, inline uh, uh, styles and you can add other, uh, and again modify them with JavaScript. So the question is after all of this, uh, what is the real value, for example, of the color attribute? Okay. Um, and this is what it is quite easy, but it's more complex. What is the actual width uh, of an element? Which is much more complex because it depends not just on the element, but it depends on the layout engine that we have around, it depends on what other elements we have around, so how it's, uh, it's more well reshaped and so on. Um, so we could uh, uh, just use a uh, uh, try to uh, query element of style dot color, uh, but in case this property was not defined by style sheet but uh, uh, was um, applying the browser styles, uh, this will be null. Is not defined. Okay, so uh, the style attribute will contain so all the CSS properties when you define them, when you are assigning something to them. Uh, if they are taken from the default styles, or in some cases they are not, uh, uh, of they are inherited. So maybe we are not setting the color on this element, we are setting the color on the parent one. So if you are querying the color attribute of that specific element, you don't find anything. Okay, because uh, uh, the the styles applied to that element are a subset of the real final styles that are used to display that element. Uh, and so uh, this is only valid if the style is applied explicitly, explicitly and directly to the element. Otherwise, you can get the computer style element dot that computer style of color 
and will tell you uh, exactly what is the uh, color value that is being used right now. It's used be because it was applied directly, uh, because it was uh, defined by some style sheet, by some parent element, by some default rule, and so on. No matter what, uh, the browser at the end decides to use the that color, and you get the, the, the value. Uh, so you, you can see that also in the in the um, in the inspector. Uh, for example, if I pull the inspector here and I try to, for example, get uh, uh, any inspect, any element, uh, I don't know, this one or this one, okay, uh, we see that we have uh, uh, some a computed hmm, a tab here that will give us uh, the final values. And these final values, for example, the color, so in this case, color is white, the, the text color is white, uh, comes from uh, the combination of all the CSS rules uh, that were uh, defined uh, before. So somewhere we have a color attribute here that was in this case in the batch primary uh, class uh, that won over all the other uh, classes. So in this case, it's an attribute that is applied, that is applied uh, to this specific class, so you will find it also on the, on the um, element properties. But in general, uh, you are sure that uh, here in the computed styles, uh, you see all the all the style all the final values. Okay, um, in in this case, you can also see what they call the browser styles here. You see this this uh, checkbox uh, that will also show you all the properties that were not modified uh, with respect to the to the default one, to the default uh, um, browser one. Okay, so if you want to know exactly what is the attribute that is, being, that is the style that is being used right now in that. Uh, in the display of that element, you can uh, query the get computed attribute. If you want to know which attribute you, you, you applied specifically to that element, you can go to the style directly. And so that's, um, and, and, and so if a style is defined locally, it's very likely to be the one that is really used. If the style is not defined here, is not defined locally, uh, then, we don't know the rule and uh, the computer style will tell us what is the final um, result of the application of the CSS. Uh, it returns the current value. So, so the current value when it's called. So if you call it different times, so you can get actually uh, what is, uh, uh, if you if you change a class somewhere, because maybe the JavaScript will change a class, uh, all the computer styles, uh, uh, you may you may remember the pipeline, how the browser processes. So you have all the, the DOM on one side, all the CSS rules on the other side, and we will uh, compute the, uh, the, the DOM with the application of the rules. Every time something changes, the DOM is the same, but the, the DOM annotated with the application of the rules will change. And so this computation will be uh, dynamically recomputed every time. Every time you change something, uh, this will be updated. Yes, we, we, we should imagine that we have actually two versions of the DOM overlaid on top of the other, okay? So the static, the static one is the one that we see here, that we have, we have nodes, we have the, the structure of the page. And then for each element, uh, we have the rules, the set of rules, and uh, the set of rules are dynamically applied, and whenever we're changing some rule, then the computed result will also change. This part is static, usually unless we are adding elements or modifying the structure of the page, but uh, uh, the rules are more dynamic and the results of the rules is uh, uh, recomputed every time. Um, uh, so I have a question about the asynchronous in slide 23. Let me pick up that slide. Uh, asynchronous JavaScript. Sync. Twenty three. Yeah. So you're asking uh, about the rest variable. 
saying uh, what block mention what is available within the final TLC. Uh, res is a promise. So this variable in a, in a synchronous behavior, uh, this, uh, this make request function, uh, so for example, let, let's see the, the, the normal case, okay? Uh, this is a promise-based uh, uh, interface. So we, since we are defining the async attribute here, what we return is uh, a promise. So actual res is a promise object, and uh, uh, it's, it's automatic, automatically created from the string. It's a promise that will return immediately, will be fulfilled immediately as long as it's generated. So what happens is that we call this make request function, it's an asynchronous function, uh, it will define uh, all the, let's use the old, the old term, the callback, and will return immediately here with a promise. Okay, so this res will be a promise. Then the function asynchronously will call uh, get API data that will take time. So uh, the make request function will wait uh, for the fulfillment of the promise coming from get API data. So in this case, it's more explicit. So we see that we are calling the function and we are waiting for the completion, for the fulfillment. In this case, it's the same uh, meaning, but uh, we are just uh, using the, the, the shorter syntax. When this uh, promise get API data is fulfilled, then we can log that on the console and return this value. Since we are in an async function, the return value is itself a promise. So this return is, a, is not returning the result, but is fulfilling this promise. So uh, the main request will get a res promise, and this promise later on will be fulfilled, and when it's fulfilled, it, uh, um, it returns the value done. So later on, we could uh, await for res to, to give a result, or we can uh, dang, dot then uh, for getting the, the, the result. So everything you do in an asynchronous way, once you have a, 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 an asynchronous behavior somewhere, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't want to use the word, this word, is infective, no? it infects everything. Uh, we, if you have an await and a synchronous behavior here, then everything that calls it is asynchronous too. Because of course the return value cannot be given immediately and needs to wait. We are, we are blocking here, so the, this done is not available until the end of this one. But this call is synchronous. So since the call is synchronous and the program must continue, uh, sorry, must continue in the next lines uh, do, to do something else, uh, we don't want to block the, the caller. And so the, re the rest is not the actual result, result that will be available later, but it's just a, a promise that the result uh, will be available sooner or later. So it's, uh, of course, it's very strange because you, you never know, <laughs> if you don't think very carefully, you never know on the next line which values are available or not. If you want to be sure that the result is uh, available, then you can await uh, for the completion of this. Of this. So it, it will block you until uh, the, this done is returned. But if you want to continue, and so you will take care of the results later on, you can just continue and call the function and uh, remember the promise that will be fulfilled later. A lot happens in, with these uh, very small keywords. Uh, we have to check if you want to use res for something later. Uh, we have to check res is not a, no. It's, it's not a matter of being empty or not. It's a matter of uh, being pending or fulfilled. If it's a promise, we can. Uh, if I, if we want to do something with the res, we have to wait until it's completed. So we res dot then and do something uh, with the uh, with the value data. Do something, uh, and say, okay, uh, I need that value. So at, the, at a given point, I will block myself and wait until the the, the data is available, and then then I can do something. Uh, it's not a good practice to. 
to check if the result is empty or not. So uh, I wouldn't call it's not that the result is empty. The result is not yet available because the promise is still pending. It's not, it doesn't be fulfilled yet. But if you if you reason like this, you are uh, thinking of a pro, of a polling procedure. Every now and then, I will check whether this data is available or not. Uh, so this is not the right right way to think asynchronously. Uh, the the data will become available when it will be available, and uh, I just have to specify what I want to happen when the data will be available. So it's not my duty to check periodically whether the data is available or not. Because otherwise, I'm thinking of a while loop that will pull the value. Uh, and I, I'm losing, uh, I'm creating blocking cycles. So you have a loop where I never exit. And while I'm in this loop, nothing else may happen. So I just say, uh, when this is available, just call me. And, the, and afterwards, I, I go away and I can sit down and do nothing because I know that I will be called when the value is available. So of course, there's a way of checking the state of a promise. You can check whether the, state, the promise is still pending or fulfilled or so, but uh, uh, we should try to, to refrain from this way of thinking. So I will rephrase your sense that you're saying, if you want to use Red for something later, uh, I would say uh, I should define what I want to happen when it will become uh, available. The only thing you can do in, in the in the middle is to cancel the promise you if you no longer need it, basically. You say, okay, we're waiting too much, uh, too long, and now the, the the interface is doing something else, so I I don't need that value anymore. So you could cancel the promise, and then the callback will be no, will not be called uh, on fulfillment, but for the rest you just let it go and wait. Okay. Any other questions? There doesn't seem to be any further issues right now. Maybe the timing of the video, of the, of the video chat is, is, not, uh, is not the ideal one, uh, because maybe it would be more useful after the lab uh, when you are started to do something. And um, and maybe you may have more time to. Uh, unfortunately, these Thursday and Friday days uh, that are just one uh, next to the other, it makes it very difficult uh, to to manage the week. Uh, but we are stuck with <laughs> with this time loss, unfortunately. Um, asking a question to the last lab, uh, yes, of course. Hi. Hi. I have a little bit, a little problem uh, with uh, um, the color of a um, bootstrap element in the last lab. May I show uh, yes, the screen? Yes, you can share the, the screen. I will close my sharing. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. Um, my goal is to uh, to make this uh, the, the click button in projects uh, with a, with a custom color. Yes. When I click it, and for now, when I click it, um, the color is uh, blue by default by the uh, type of uh, element I used by Bootstrap. And I, I was wondering if there is a, a property that, that I'm not using correctly to change the color when um, the, let's say, button is clicked. Because what what I, classes are you using in these buttons? Uh, there are no, it's not a button, it's this class here, yeah. nav link. Uh, here I was trying something, but doesn't work. Uh, nav link and here I I managed to change the background color when uh, when yes. hovering, but when I click, it uh, uh, returns blue. Uh, clicking is um, is not managed just by CSS alone, because the CSS is a stateless uh, mechanism, so it will uh, compute a style. Depends on the current situation, the current values of the attributes. Okay, uh, when you are clicking something, you are actually executing some event handler that will change the, the classes of the element uh, in, uh, in in real time, basically. So actually, uh, you know that in, when we are loading Bootstrap, you are all loading some some uh, some JavaScript at the end. So it's that JavaScript that uh, uh, gets the um, uh, sorry the uh, the click event and will change the classes of that element. Okay. Uh, and so we'll add another class that is what is forks in the core because otherwise the, um, how to say the, uh, the, any element will never remember when it's clicked. I click it. So when the mouse is over, it generates the mouse over event. Okay. And then when the mouse is out, also the mouse out, um, I have the pseudo attribute hover that will be valid uh, whenever the mouse is over it. I can, uh, but uh, when I, I can have the CSS pseudo element that tell me when the button, where we are clicking it. So when the button, the mouse button is pressed, but after the, the click is finished, um, CSS doesn't have any way to remember this button has been clicked in the past. Well, there's no rules for that. There's no memory. So CSS recomputation is done from scratch every time. It doesn't remember. So what's happening there is that when you are clicking, the JavaScript code in the Bootstrap library will change some, some class. So what you, you should do is if you go to the browser, uh, open the inspector, and see what which class. Uh, so just inspect this element, the, the, the tree, for example. Number three, yes, you try to inspect it. Yeah. Okay. Here. And then you see these classes and try to click on, click on it. And some class should have okay. been changed. Maybe this one, leveling active. Okay, so we're not. So the uh, bootstrap is adding or removing the active class. And so the, this blue comes from the definition of active. Uh, okay, so if I if you redefine active like in your mean, custom code, uh, nav link active, you should be able. Not all active, only on on nav link maybe. Maybe I would define it only in the div that contains those elements. But okay, just to try. yeah, yeah, just to test. That's the theory. Okay, so background color. Uh, Okay. Um, That's not enough. Mm. No. Uh, so you look at the red uh, in the right side when there's a list of styles. You see the background Sorry? color. If you look at on the on the second panel down in the, in the inspector. You see that uh, uh, mm -hmm. no, uh, what is it? you change something. Okay, there was uh, 
are you inspecting? No, you're inspecting no, the link sorry. right now. Okay. Okay. Now uh, it's two, okay. Okay, you see background color there is the blue one, which is yeah. defined by nav pills, nav link active, and then nav. So okay. maybe nav pills is also uh, in, uh, is also, try to delete this background color, this rule here, click. Uh, no, uh, it's uh, it's become and then it will take uh, the navlink hover rule and so on. So there's a lot of rules uh, that are uh, competing for this color, and so it's a matter of understanding uh, maybe by trial or maybe by uh, by reading the, the Bootstrap documentation for where it defines custom styles, uh, how you can redefine uh, the colors and so on. Okay. So, but basically, the the, the yeah, issue is I that can, uh, we are you, you need to redefine a different class from what we had before because in the selected states it will have the, the active uh, active class in addition to the other ones. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I will try to yeah maybe act this little thing. Yes. You, you need to get this background color deleted here because you are uh, say uh, deleted and say in the browser because it will apply something else. So you just maybe I can around. override this rule copying and uh, modify a little background color, like uh, let's say if it works. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> worked. It worked. Thank you. So maybe it's a bit too much, but uh, right now we have, we have the, the principle. Okay, okay. Uh, there's a message from uh, from Rock, uh, so the comment from Rock that says, uh, you wrote a nav link at space dot active, where should be nav link dot active? Uh, no, the space is, is fine because it means uh, uh, active inside nav link. Space is the operator for saying an element inside the other. You should not join them uh, because uh, um, uh, it will be. Ah, yes, 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 you are right. You're right. Because we what we want to do here is to match an element that has the both classes active. Instead, with the space, we are matching an element where each child element has the other class. So if you want to uh, activate both classes on the same element, we don't have the space. Yes, Rocco, you're right. Um, Enrico is asking, uh, is there any way to make our own custom colors other than button primer, button secondary design? Should we make our own class and define the corresponding color in CSS? Um, yes, there are, oh, okay. You can define the colors uh, class by class by overriding the, the, the default colors from Bootstrap, or you could uh, define a sort of a style, uh, let's say, a custom style for Bootstrap. So there is a way of creating a, a Bootstrap allows you, but it's it's complex, I would say. Okay, you need uh, to create a new style and then apply this. In Bootstrap number three, uh, version three, it was easier because you just have to provide your own CSS files. In in four, it's more complex because it's uh, the internal architecture of Bootstrap has been uh, re redesigned. Uh, but uh, you can you can do that. It gets a bit more effort. Okay. Um, usually, um, let me say this: when we uh, when we use a styling framework, uh, we are trying to use the styles as much as possible. The styles that are provided uh, with the framework. Okay. Uh, it's not that you tomorrow you will develop uh, uh, I don't know an Android application. And you change the color for the application menu, or for the settings menu, or so. Uh, you are just using the system colors. So if you have an, an OK button, a toast, uh, that, that will take the color from the system. Uh, and uh, also, for example, here we have, a, we have an editor open, and the color of the menus and the text. Uh, it would be surprising if every application had different colors for and fonts and so on for for the different uh, elements so usually uh, the the these styling frameworks gives us a set of styles that 
we should start using them. And if we want, we can we may customize them. We can redefine them, but it's a lot of design work. So, for example, even the the the, the task of finding colors that mesh well together <laughs> is very difficult. So, so usually, uh, you know, there are these design styles, like material design. You have the style, uh, the library for having something that looks like the material design in uh, in uh, in the Google, let's say, uh, universe, or maybe like Fluent Design in the Windows universe. And they use a set of styles, fonts, spacing, colors, background, shadings that are consistent and give you the look of that. If you only customize a bit, uh, that it, it risk of being inconsistent or being very strange. So it's good for learning, but uh, uh, be, a, be aware that unless you are a good designer, visual designer, uh, usually computer science people are very bad at this kind of thing. So it's better to find, to use a, a consistent uh, set of styles and try to, to apply them as a general rule. This is, the, this is what you are looking for. Let me share the screen. Where is that? Here in the documentation, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, customized booster for our new built-in SAS variable for global style preferences for easy theming and component changes. So this is the right way to go. Instead of, uh, uh, modifying on the fly the styles that have been applied by Bootstrap. Uh, Bootstrap is based on SAS. We just talked before about uh, less than SAS. And so you can uh, modify the variables that the SAS rules are using to, to create all the Bootstrap styles. So if you really want to do that, the, the right uh, say path, the right uh, procedure is to start at the beginning and uh, you download the, the Bootstrap instead of loading from the uh, from the network, and uh, um, you have this, uh, you create this custom uh, uh, SAS style CSS sheet, and you can uh, uh, define. Uh, okay, there are all the all the details uh, uh, um, to to modify. Maybe you know body background is that this is a variable in SAS, and you are setting it differently. So you are overriding the normal. Uh, in, this case, in this case, it will be um, white over black. So you are making a, a black version. And, and so you are defining some basic variables, uh, and then Bootstrap will uh, uh, use those. Uh, whenever it needs uh, the background color, it will use this variable. When it needs the foreground color, it will use that variable, and so on. So that's the where you find the documentation for, um, for customizing your, your Bootstrap colors. And of course, you then you need, uh, you see this mo node modules uh, part, but you need to recompile the uh, SAS into, into, um, into CSS basic uh, uh, commands. And so you will, that, uh, you will use a node module for doing that, for the SAS compiler in node, and that's all that, so that you can recompile it uh, and uh, uh, the project will have the, the updated CSS uh, from Booster. So, like, like I said, it can be done. It's a bit more complex than just uh, uh, modifying some, uh, some attributes. Okay, just be aware that it's a long journey. <laughs> okay. Anyone more? 
or should we should we close here? Just remember that when you're doing the exercise or, or when you're studying, even next week, even if it's uh, you know, Easter vacation, we all know the, where we will spend the Easter vacation, so at home. And so if you have any need for support, uh, just write uh, on, on Slack. Uh, that we can, uh, we would be able to, to answer you uh, even in the, in the next week. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, since I don't see to, that doesn't seem to be any any new issues, uh, I, I I propose to close the session, and uh, tomorrow the, you will have the lamb, laboratory number three again. It's something that can be uh, started uh, more or less quickly, but to be completed you will need uh, to search and find solutions. Uh, so you, you will find support during the lab and also afterwards, uh, and uh, and then we'll skip until the, the week after Easter. So thank you for for coming, and see you next week. Uh, no, not next week, but in two weeks. Bye bye.